This episode of the Aquarius Podcast is sponsored by Aquarium Co-op. Corey and the team at Aquarium Co-op have redefined the tropical fish and plant buying experience. Aquarium Co-op provides incredibly healthy fish, gorgeous plants, and top quality lights, food, and accessories at competitive prices. So how do I know this? Well, I'm fortunate enough to call them my local fish store where I've purchased many of the aforementioned items. Now you may not live in the greater Seattle area, but that shouldn't stop you from checking them out. Pay close attention. Listeners of this podcast can get 5% off AquariumCoop.com orders by using the promo code Aquarius5 at checkout. One more time, that promo code is Aquarius5. And if their retail operation wasn't enough, they bring exceptional video content to the Aquarium Co-op YouTube channel. I encourage you to check out the instructional how-to, travel, and fish room tour videos. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Lastly, be sure to share the Aquarius podcast with your fish nerd friends. Now, on to the interview. Today's date is Wednesday, September 12th, 2018. My guest is Pam Chin. Pam is a cichlid fanatic and involved with many aspects of her hobby. She's an honorary member of the Pacific Coast Cichlid Association, longtime member of the American Cichlid Association, having served as secretary and chairman for the Board of Trustees. She was also named an ACA Fellow, which is the highest level of distinction they give for supporting the organization. Pam has written countless articles featured in Bunt Barsh Bulletin, Cichlid News, and the Cichlid Room Companion. Pam is a founding member of the Babes in the Cichlid Hobby, a group that raises money and awareness for conservation efforts. Lastly, Pam has been to a variety of amazing locations like Lake Malawi, Lake Tanganyika, South America, and Mexico. So Pam, welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to speak with me. Um, and just full disclaimer, the Bunt Barsh, I butchered that like three or four times, and you had to help me phonetically <laughs> pronounce that out so I could get no that worries. correct. And, uh, and one more time for the audience, so what is the Bunt Barsh Bulletin? Uh, the Bunt Barsh Bulletin is the publication from the American Cichlid Association. So I believe it comes out, uh, it's either four or six times a month or I mean a year, you get uh, four to six issues. And um, it's usually articles written by other uh, um, ACA members. Um, there's also, um, you know, people that write travelogues when they travel, um, interest in new species, uh, you know, breeding strategies, uh, that type of thing. So it's uh, more of an advanced hobbyist. Uh, driven, very interesting. If you're into breeding fish, you'll find it fascinating. Yeah, very cool. And Bunt Barsh is uh, cichlid in German, correct? Uh huh. The right. way I understand it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, that's uh, until somebody disputes this. I, I, let's let's roll with that right. one. And since, okay. this, since it's just you and I, I think we're going to be okay for this talk. So, so Pam, you have a very lengthy resume. I mean, you know, your, your pedigree, your credentials in the hobby, I mean, based on, on what I read, I mean, to me, it feels fairly undisputed that, you know, you should, that you're going to know what you're talking about and you've done a lot of really cool stuff, but where did it all start for you? So what are some of your first memories of, of fish and maybe, you know, your first personal aquarium? Well, I really didn't know anything about fish until I met my husband. And uh, when I first met him, he had tanks all over his house, and I just was enamored uh, with all the fish tanks. And he was into, um, tank, I call them tank busters. So he had, like, the big knife fish and the arowanas and Oscars and, you know, all these huge tank buster fish. And um, I was just fascinated by it. And so as our relationship uh, carried on, you know, I got more and more into the fish, and uh, we joined a club, a local club in Sacramento, and that's kind of how it all blew, blew up but after that. You know, we got into this club, and then we met other people that were as crazy as we were about fish. And uh, it wasn't long before we got into cichlids because uh, you want to breed fish, and, and cichlids are, are typically easy ones to start with to breed. And um, he had already had Oscars and discus and angels and and uh, so we just, you know, a lot of people go, wow, you have so much going on and so many tanks. But, you know, it's been a long progression. It's not like we went out and got all this stuff in, in uh, a couple of weeks. You know, we've been working at it for many, many, many years. Yes. So, um, and, he, and Gary, my husband, my fin mate forever, um, he, is, uh, he is really the fish person. And he is like a master aquarist. 
So, yeah, I feel like I was really, really taught by the best. He's absolutely amazing. You can give him any kind of fish, and he can be successful with it. So um, I've had a very, very good teacher. Oh, awesome. And so to kind of go back to your guys' first meetings, and, you know, you're going to, to his house for the first time, and you see all these tanks, there was never any red flags like, oh, man, what is going on here? What am I getting myself into? Um, not really, because, I mean, I think everybody needs a hobby, and, and uh, you know, whether it's fast cars or dogs or, you know, you get three people together and you want to have a club. And uh, it was just something that we're really both really interested in. We just really, you know, we just love to fish and we love to sit around and watch them and feed them. And, and so um, it's the bad part is, is that there's really no control because, you know, Gary, Gary would say, I think we can fit a tank here. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, can I drive you to the lumber store so you can build a stand? You know, there's nobody saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, do you really need that other tank or do you really need the, these fish? And so, um, but that's the only thing that's out of control. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. So. And, yeah, you know, and so it's something that we have worked together with now for so many years and we just, it's just really a big part of our life. Oh, good times. And so uh, the, the cichlid fascination for you right so i know that you mentioned the, mm -hmm. of the tank busters that he had initially oscars which oscars are very near and dear to my heart um what were some mm -hmm. of the first cichlids that really caught your attention and you know really turned you on to become a cichlid fanatic well i just think that um once uh gary realized that he could breed these fish then it was just anything we could breed and then uh we were very fortunate to be you know where we were really kind of in our heyday of learning about fish and all these different species. In the 80s, all of these fish were new, and they were all just coming in. And so it was just a, an amazing time to be into the fish hobby because there were just so many fish that had never been in the hobby before, and they were just, like, coming in every week. You know, there'd be another guy bringing in, you know, 10, 15 species of fish that no one had ever seen before. And so um, that would really get you pumped up, you know. And you wanted to be the first one on the block to get the fish and to breed the fish and, and uh, you know, be able to pass it around. And so I think now, uh, you know, as far as the Rift Lake cichlids are concerned, you know, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi, most everything has been imported by now. Everything has pretty much been discovered. There's really not, you know, there's really not anything new. We have the lumpers and the splitters that are, you know, splitting out species that were previous species. But... In the big picture, you know, we've pretty much um, explored these lakes for aquarium fish, and they've all been imported at one point or another. They may not be in the hobby now, but they they still were imported at one time. Sure. So to, to go back to kind of that, you know, the 1980s, the really, you know, mm -hmm. uh, exciting time, new fish, you know, the, the, the race, the, the breeding arms race, if you will. Do you have any mm -hmm. where you two were the first ones to kind of cross the finish line with a certain cichlid um, that, you know, you're able to crack the code and, and let everybody else know? Oh, you know, uh, all of these clubs have uh, Breeders Award programs where you, um, if you spawn your fish, you bring it in and you would get points. And uh, seriously, there were so many fish coming in, and um, it's just hard to say uh, exactly, you know, which one or which direction we went. Um, I think mostly because uh, the the fish from Malawi are so colorful that that was a big draw, and um, very easy to keep and very easy to breed. Do you have any particular ones where, you know, maybe that it might have been a little bit of a tough, tougher cookie to crack and, you know, that you're especially proud to, to kind of talk about being able to breed? Uh, not with my secret weapon, Gary. <laughs> I mean, that guy, he can, he, he can breed anything. Oh, that's so some, you know, some fish are, are a little tougher and a little harder. But, uh, you know, we're very lucky. We have a lot of tanks. You know, we can give them the proper... Um, surroundings that they need and um he's just able to you know he studies up on them he knows what they eat what kind of protein they need you know when they're more apt to breed you know uh, when it's a full moon and the lights in the fish house are on at midnight and we're running around you know so it it's uh we're excited at any time anything breeds really oh. Excellent. So is there any kind of general advice, like when newer people in the club, um, you know, join or maybe somebody from ACA reaches out to you for just kind of general beginner breeder advice that, mm -hmm. that you two like to share as kind of a rules of thumb? 
Yeah, I, I would I would like to. Everybody wants wild fish, and uh, you know it's really not necessary. And especially in the hobby today, almost they're all of the popular uh, fish are are um, either bred by hobbyists or are mass bred. And it is so much easier to work with fish uh, that have been bred in the aquarium or or uh, in a pond than it is to work with the wild stock. And so my advice would be, you know, if you want to get your feet wet with it, then, you know, don't start with wild because it's very depressing when you spend all this money on fish. You know, you end up killing them because, you you know, you do something stupid. So um, get your feet wet, you know, learn how to... Uh, you know, learn the behaviors and the husbandry of the fish. And uh, you, you really you just got to keep them wet and and uh, study up a little bit, find out what they eat, give them the proper size aquarium and tank mates, and, and you shouldn't really have any problems. But I do think a key for starting is don't think you have to have wild. And and I think older hobbyists will tell you that. Um uh, and especially if you came over to my house and walk around, you probably couldn't tell what was wild and what's, you know, 15 generations later. So it's uh, uh, your dollar goes farther, I guess is what I'm trying to say as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can totally, you know, get that impression in the hobby, um, you know, depending on what you know, what social media group you're on or whatnot, that, you know, this this idea that wild does carry a, a you know, greater level of prestige to it. But I do also know that, you know, wild does cost a lot more money and that, you know, if you're mm-hmm. the one that's going mm-hmm. to, to bear the burden of that and, you know, try to be somebody importing it on your own, you may end up costing a lot of money. So if you are a beginner, certainly if you're, you know, advanced or, or an, an expert, obviously you don't need me to saying anything about it. Um, but yeah, fantastic advice for beginners. So then let, let's talk about how do you then transition into being such a prolific writer then? Well, I didn't even know I could write. And um, um, the Pacific Coast Cichlid Association started up uh, about the same time that we started going to clubs, too, in the 80s. And this is a regional cichlid club um, out of San Jose, California. And we were just so excited to meet fish people that, because uh, we're 150 miles away from there, so it was a 300-mile round trip. But it was nothing. I mean, we, we had to go every single month to the meetings. We just loved the people and and uh, everything about it. And so, um, of course, they had a publication. Kurt Zadnick was the editor, and he just... Uh, begged me to write and I said I don't know what to write about and he goes well what if we give you questions and I said oh that would be great because I can always answer a question but I can never come up with a subject you know to write an article about and so that's kind of how Ask Pam got started and was in the Cichlidae Communique was their publication and um, oh I probably was had done it for six or seven years and then I became very good friends with Juan Miguel Artigas Cezayas, who is the curator of Cichlid Room Companion, and he wanted to put Ask Pam on the Cichlid Room Companion. And it was like, well, what am I going to do with it? Of course, take it, do whatever you want with it. So it was a big hit, and and, um, over time I've just become better and better friends with Juan Miguel and so proud to be um, associated with the Cichlid Room Companion. I mean, it is the Cichlid site. for the entire world, really. Uh, there's not any other site that is up to date uh, as that site. So um, it's just I can't talk enough about how wonderful that site is. And that, it, you know, if you join the American Cichlid Association, you do get a subscription to the Cichlid Room Companion. And then it's worth the membership just for that. Excellent. So so let's do, let's do this. Let's go. Um, can you give me kind of a, you know, a, your... You know, two or three minutes spiel on, and I've checked out the Cichlid Room Companion, so it is awesome, and, and spiel may not be the correct term, but can you give us kind of the pitch for, you know, why somebody should check out the Cichlid Room Companion, kind of what it's about, maybe high level, um, and, then right. if you could, and then if you could go back and talk about your Ask Pam section, and um, I, I guess mm-hmm. one aspect of that I'm curious about is, was it always kind of the, the editors feeding you questions, or did ACA members have the opportunity to submit questions to you? Well, in the beginning, you know, we had to beg for questions a little bit, but uh, as time went on, um, you know, people would just send me questions. And then, uh, you know, at this time, email is starting up and forums are starting up. And and so it just kind of got out that, um, you know, I had a question and answer column. And, um, you know, I would just get questions from all over. And to this day, I still get tons of questions. It's amazing. And I really, really like it because... 
it really helps me review the question. You know, it helps my knowledge as well. Like I may not have worked with that fish for 10 or 15 years, or I may never have worked with that fish, but I can, I can research it and, and uh, share some information or might be able to direct you to someone that is keeping that fish, you know, and the whole, the whole um, point was, of as Pam was, you know, I could be a starting point for you. I may not have the answer, but I'll do the research and I'll find somebody that, uh, that does. And, and that way you'll get your question answered. And, uh, as far as the sick room, cichlid room companion, um, that, uh, is all, uh, you know, all cichlids. So from cichlids all across the world, Central America, South America, and um, it's Juan Miguel has divided it up so that the experts have the um, are responsible for the species. And so anytime anything happens, because these people are dialed into the scientific stuff way before we are, like Odd Konings and Paul Loisel and many of these people that um, really know the fish, then they're updating the species. So it's the latest and greatest information. So if you uh, want to breed a fish or do some research on a fish, maybe be, uh, for as a tank mate, want to know what, what this fish eats and what's its behavior in the wild. Uh, this is a quick reference. You can just go right in there. You click on the species and, you know, it, it tells you all about it. And if you, uh, you can also uh, um, access articles written by other aquarists and other scientific uh, ichthyologist uh, papers. And references. Um, you can find bibliographies about where all these uh, articles are. The, the article isn't there. It can tell you what magazine it was in, and then you can find that magazine to get the article. So it is an unbelievable resource, uh, you know, when you're looking for fish, because there really isn't a book on all cichlids uh, that's of anything current. I mean, the only thing I can think of was the lexicon um, that Tetra put out, and oh my goodness, that was you know, 25 years ago. So um, it's really hard to, you know, keep up on all of that, but he has quite the crew. And uh, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So if you, I mean, even if you have kind of an inkling of interest in cichlids, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've, yeah. ju I've just perused this site, you know, very high level and it is chock full of information and the way that you can search through this it's very very user friendly um it's mm -hmm. super awesome and honestly like i, I want to talk more about the cichlid, cichlid room companion but uh, a spoiler i may have juan on here in the future episode <laughs> which, yeah well which i would be highly advise that yeah he's, he's the one of the nicest guys in the whole world to start with i just adore the man yeah. and um you know he's simply amazing and uh i've traveled quite a bit with him and he he can, he's continually working on that site 24 seven. <laughs> he's just the craziest guy in the world. Yeah. that's really cool. So that it's not something it's, that he's, he's totally amazing. You should definitely get him. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, this is a site that, you know, information was just dumped into it 10 years ago and it's never been touched since then. Like a lot of, you know, there, right. there's a lot of sites out there like that on the, on the internet, not just in the fish hobby, but in many mm -hmm. in, in, all over the place. Right. Uh, but this yeah. thing continually yeah. being updated by experts in the field is really, really cool. Um, so, again, mm -hmm. if, if you have any interest in cichlids, I mean, this is definitely something that you should check out. So, Pam, let's go Let's go back to you. Um, so on the Ask Pam column, I, I'm just curious, do you have any memorable questions that were sent to you? Anything that, like, really stumped you and you really had to work out for a long time before you could uh, send an oh, answer God. in? or? Yeah, the hardest thing for me, to it's really hard for me to ID fish. I kind of have an idea, and a lot of people want their fish ID'd. And it's really, you know, it's really a difficult thing to do um, because, especially if it's not something that's common, it's, it, can be, it can be hard. Or, and there's so many hybrids right now as well. So uh, uh, I guess I say I struggle with that, and it's kind of tough uh, to do it. But I have good support, too, and I can send it to... Uh, to other people and have them, you know, uh, help me sort it down. But, um, oh, there's, uh, you know, we've had some real good discussions on uh, uh, things like um, uh, with mouth brooders, whether, um, you know, it's beneficial to strip or not to strip, and does, does the stripping affect the fry in the future? If, if those fry were stripped, are they going to hold? Or, or do they not hold? Um, that's always a good topic. 
and uh, how to tumble eggs. You know, it's such an important tool uh, to learn if you're going to work with mouth breeding species. And, for example, I, I love Trophius, which is, a, you know, a higher dollar uh, fish from Lake Tanganyika that is a mouth breeder. But the concept is the same as the cheapest Simbuna from Lake Malawi that you can find. So if you, uh, you know, have high expectations of working with a high dollar mouth breeder, but you've never tumbled eggs before, you know, it's really important that you, you know, you learn that before you, you don't want to learn it with that fish. You want to know how to do it before. So um, some of these husbandry issues are really, really popular because people, you know, everybody's got a, got a little, uh, may have a tip or two on what works for them. And, and uh, you can take all these uh, angles and, and put them together and kind of maybe apply them to your setup. And, and so uh, the other thing about ASPAM that I really like is that it's, uh, it's just me. You know, when you get on a forum and on Facebook as well, uh, I have a hard time when there's 45 other people throwing their ideas at someone. And I really like the idea of just, you know, I'm just giving you my opinion. And, you know, I hope you find it helpful. But I'm not here to argue or fight or, you know, get into it with anyone. It's just it's just my opinion. So, you know, I hope I hope it works for you. Yeah, the, um, there's a certain beauty in, in simplicity, and I was talking to a, a guest earlier today um, before you and I are talking now, and, you know, we were talking about when, back in the day when he was in the hobby, you know, starting out, he'd have to go to the library, right, and there were only maybe six books on tropical fish in the entire library, and, you know, sure, that's not nearly as convenient as today with the internet, but there's there's a there's a beauty in, the, in that simplicity, in that you're not getting all of this information overload um, of what you can find on the internet, and more more often than not, like sure, not everything published in a book has is, is always been 100% accurate, you know, all the time. But you know, you, you can feel pretty comfortable using those books. Where on the internet, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, and you have to be very careful on what information that you take in because there's so much bad information out there, so much misinformation. Right. So I can really appreciate right. going back to something like an Ask Pam column, where you know it's it's somebody that's been in the hobby for a really long time and and has had a lot of you know, experience to be able to just kind of quiet out the noise and ask that direct question and get your opinion on it. Yeah, I really like it that way um, because I just think that, um, and it's not to say that those 45 other people that want to jump in on it don't have good ideas, but uh, it's like you said, there's just so much coming at you, then you have, it's impossible for you to sort it out if you're new. And so, um, so I, I think it's, it's worked well for that reason. Some people want to reply or, or get upset because they can't uh, do a follow-up question. You have to start a new question. And uh, get, they get a little frustrated with that. But in the long run, I think that it's really the way to go. Yeah, excellent. And so on the mouth brooder subject, where, where do you lie? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the Ask Pam opinion on mouth brooders and, and stripping? Oh, I'm stripping. Oh, I think that it's imprinted in the fry. Um, and that it doesn't make any difference if you strip or not. And I think that where people kind of get hung up on this is that um, they think, you know, I mean, in the wild, not every fish breeds, okay? And in order to reproduce, you know, you've, it has to be the fittest, and it has to, you know, have it had to eat enough before the holding period, and there's so many factors, and there are so many fish that cannot, you know, complete all of those items and end up losing their brood. And in the aquarium, we get the fish and we strip them. And then um, people will try to breed those fry and, you know, some may hold and some may not. But I think we have to consider that there are, the fish are not all good parents. And this is typically imprinted on them because I, you know, over the years, I've had many um, different species where, you know, we've stripped them. Sometimes we, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Some have been stripped, some have held a term, and um, I have not noticed any, um, you know, any, anything that would be out of the ordinary. Um, I think that just some fish are just unable to reproduce. So they're never, you know, and, and people don't blame it on the fish. They blame it on, on, uh, well, I guess they try to blame it on the fish, but really there's just not much you can do about that. But it even happens in the wild, so you just have to kind of remember that. Not every fish is going to breed. So. 
Yeah, no, that's excellent. Thank you very much for uh, for sharing your opinion on that. And you know, I I, de- I know after this conversation, I'll, I'm going to key in a lot more and, and check out some of the uh, the previous Ask Pam uh, articles and and really dive in and see you know where you've landed on on some of the questions that have been uh, posed to you. So sure. So let's talk about the babes and the cichlid hobby, which. Um, has a, a like the the abbreviation for that right like i don't want to say it out loud if you want to say it you can but talk about the babes in the cichlid hobby well the babes in the cichlid hobby we started up like in 1994 and basically we're just women aquarists and we just want to be one of the guys and when you get three or four women together and then they kind of intimidate the guys and so, uh, you know, we just wanted to get in closer to the inner circle. And um, so we just started doing fun things. And, you know, we most of it was just, you know, practical jokes and, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, or we'd have a, a guest midnight speaker at the ACA convention. Most everything we do is at the ACA convention because, you know, that's the biggest gathering of cichlid keepers yearly. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's a big party. These cichlid people really know how to party. And, and so we just have a ton of fun with it. And uh, as time went on, so then we started collecting money, like at the hospitality room, and, and to donate to the Guy Jordan Fund for the American Cichlid Association, which is a research fund. And uh, the money is in the bank, and they only take the interest, and they award it to a student. Uh, that wants to do research on cichlids and people would apply for the money. And, and so anyway, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, we want to give back to the hobby. And uh, so we started doing things to kind of raise some money. And then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a few years later, Caroline Estes uh, out of Texas and I are real good friends and Pam Marsh were kind of the three musketeers of the Babes and the Cichlid Hobby. And uh, we went to a um, fish uh, weekend in New Jersey, and they had this silent auction. And they had like 10 items on the table, and they had, you know, some um, uh, old aquarium literature, and there was like a framed picture, and, you know, there was like 10 items. And, I mean, they made like $2,000 on these 10 items. And we just thought, wow, you know, maybe that's something we could do. Uh, at ACA. And so I think it was, it's almost been 20 years. So we did this mailing out and we told everybody to bring all their, uh, you know, that we would take anything as long as it's fish related and what that we would uh, sell it at the silent auction. So now all these people bring uh, items, you know, that, um, whether it's t-shirts, uh, kitchen stuff, artwork, um, aquarium decorations and then the vendors help us out they give us uh you know filters and food and and that type of thing and we run this silent auction for uh two days at the aca and then we give the money back um to now they have two funds they have the conservation fund the paul Loisel conservation fund and they still have the research fund and then we also uh, skim off a little money for um the Stuart grant um conservation fund as well which is very close to my heart in the in the Rift Lakes. So we're not really officially um, affiliated with the ACA, but we're all ACA people, and we use them for their venue <laughs> to raise our money, and then you know we give it back to them. You're, so you're kind of this. It's, you're it's kind of really this, a lot of fun. You're like you're like a rogue shadow cell with a benevolent mission. Right. Right. And uh, we just have so much fun with it. Well, then they, uh, I don't know, then a few years later, they asked us if uh, we would do the, uh, you know, the Florida fish farmers donate fish to the ACA for the convention. And um, sometimes they would do those in a silent auction right out of the tank. And somebody got the wild idea that if we had an auction, we might be able to, um, you know, bring in more money. And so uh, Caroline asked this as a uh, fantastic auctioneer and she can really captivate an audience and so we started the of course we have the sign auction so now we have the oral auction as well and that is a live auction we usually do it on friday night and it's like from 10 to midnight there's lots of drinking and you know and screaming but uh 
we can we have been able to raise so much money and you know people will pay more because they know it's going to a good cause and uh, the support that uh, you know it's back to um, the women have just guided the men they wanted to give the money okay but they just didn't know how to do it and now we have facilitated this into a silent auction and an oral auction and but we would not be able to do any of it without the support of the the males in the hobby because and that's the other thing you know the hobby is the fish hobby is like 99 percent male so yeah no it, that's the other thought to that i mean it, it definitely is and um you know it, it is male dominated but you know it's it, it's a hobby though where there's no reason why women shouldn't shouldn't be involved and shouldn't be encouraged and it's great to hear you know what happens when women do get involved and become so active and you have these super fun you know activities like the you know the the oral auction where I can yeah. I can only imagine how wild it is and I hope that sometime in the future I can go out to an ACA convention <laughs> and just because I can just picture well, uh, how it crazy is it probably just an gets. Absolute blast! I'll tell you. And uh, the girls all dress up. Well, it's an all girl auction. We have all girl runners, and um, and then you know we people kind of help us out. Like um, there's a whole crew from Bermuda that usually comes to the ACA convention. And they serve these, they call them dark and stormies, and they are, it's like Bermuda and rum and ginger beer, and uh, they serve drinks there. And uh, the Mexican uh, contingency brings us tequila, and so we have tequila. And so it's a, you know, it's really a a fun party. And um, it's amazing, though, those guys, I mean, they are so good to us when it comes to, uh, you know, pulling out their wallets and, and uh, paying extra for the fish and having a good time. So it's, it's a lot of fun when everybody's having a good time. Oh, that is awesome. Uh, do you want to take a, chan- a moment to talk about the Stewart Grant Fund and, and a little bit about what that, what that is? Well, the Stewart Grant uh, Conservation Fund, um, you know, Stewart Grant passed away in 2007, I think. And uh, he was a very good friend of Odd Coney. And he did so much for the hobby in Malawi. He uh, was from the United Kingdom, and he was uh, uh, Malawi was a British colony. And um, somehow or another, there's there's a story how he ended up. They wanted him to work in the fisheries, and um, he is really the guy that sent you know began to send all these fish over. And he had a he still does his kids run it now. It's a huge facility on the right on the shoreline of Malawi, and um, so uh, he and Odd were very very close. And and in his honor, Odd J. Stoffer, who is another ichthyologist out of Penn State, um, came up with this as a a way to honor him. And the funds are used for both Rift Lakes. Um, and one of the greatest things that they've done is that we've actually been able to raise, uh, you know, because a lot of the fish are overcollected by the ornamental hobby. And uh, it's so in, in Tanganyika and in Malawi, there are populations that are so small uh, that once they're overcollected, they're never, you know, they're never going to come back. And it's very, very rare that you're able to replant those populations uh, because of all the uh, rules and regulations. I mean, you could never bring the fish from the United States, but because they're bred on the Malawi shoreline, we can put them back in the lake. And uh, we've, I think they've done six trips of psilocybe back to um, Taiwani Reef, which is clear out in the middle of the lake, and it's probably down 60 feet from the water line. Um, and it's this huge reef, and it's the only place that um, uh, Pseudotrophia psilocy is found. Its name has changed. It's not Pseudotrophia psilocy anymore, but it's psilocy. And it's the only place in Malawi that it's found. And then we've also got another uh, guy uh, out of Chipoke um, that has bred a couple species for us as well. Um, and I, but that has not been as quite as successful as the psilocy replant. Part of the problem is, is that the ornamental collectors just go back and take them again. So that's very sad. So we really have, this is another reason why if you want to buy a wild fish, then do a little research, find out if this fish is at risk in its natural habitat, then you certainly don't want to um, purchase wild. Yeah, and and with these Rift Lake cichlids, I mean, my understanding isn't a good number of them on our, uh, they're already on like the CARES priority list or they're, they're listed in IUCN as being kind of at risk? There are some, yes. Um, 
more from Malawi than Tanganyika. And Malawi is, uh, I'm very, very worried about Malawi. It's uh, kind of going to hell in a handbasket. The country is just, you know, it's like the poorest nation in the whole world. And uh, the government is just, uh, just cannot get it together. And they, um, you know, they used to not let them fish in the national park, which is an UNESCO world site. Mm-hmm. And they can't even control the people. And, and on the other hand, I'm feeling so sorry for the people, too, because they're starving. They've been in a drought now for two or three years. Um, the population has increased uh, two or three times in the last 10 years. And uh, there's just not enough food to, for, for these people. There's not enough jobs for them. They just live on the shoreline. The only thing they can do uh, for their family is to fish. Um, but it's all, it's all um, because the government has really let them down. And... Um, I was in Malawi in 2017, and it was very, very sad. I was in the National Park, and there were um, fishermen all over the place, um, seine netting, uh, all kinds of huge, big nets where they're just taking thousands and thousands of fish. Um, The water is turning green because the open water fish, there's no fish to eat the plankton. And so that's the first thing that's going to happen is, you know, the algae cannot get out of the water column and... Uh, it's just going to get darker and darker, so then the algae's not going to grow, and it's just the whole lake is going to collapse. So, um, but before that happens, they'll probably eat all the fish. So, I just don't see anything positive in Malawi right now. Wow, so it's very sad. Uh, yeah, from your perspective, is it you know you, you want to get back to the Rift Lakes, back to Lake Malawi, and and visit and just appreciate it while it's there? Is that kind of you know is that well, kind of in the back of your mind? It was a very it, the, my trip in 2017, two years ago, it was a very, very sad trip. It was just, I came home, I was very, very depressed, and then everybody wanted me to do a talk. And so I put a talk together, but even that was depressing, you know. Um, and I just don't know, um, I don't know if I'll go back or not. Because I just, uh, there's nothing I can do. I've done everything I can do there. And... Um, it's so sad to let go of it because we were just making such great progress. But I, I'm just really worried. Um, this year, um, I don't know if you know Larry Johnson or not. He's a guy out of Canada. He goes every year. He's gone every year for the last 20 years. And he usually does a, a um, dive trip, and eight or so guys go with him. And they usually go north, but this year they're going to go to the National Park. So I, and they've just left. So I'm excited to hear what, they're, what they discover. Um, if it's any, you know, what kind of conditions that they think are, are going on there. So, we'll have to see. But from what I saw when I was there, I don't know. So, I, it just does not look good. And I was trying to help with a aquaculture uh, issue where maybe we could get a couple of these villages to do some aquaculture where, you know, you would breed them in a basket. Or actually you breed them on land, but then you put them in a basket and raise them up. But... uh there are so many people on the shoreline right now in the national park that um, it, it just would not work out. There would just be, you know, um, they're worried about people sabotaging the baskets. Um, you may keep two villages taking care of the fish, but then there's 40 villages on both sides of them that need the fish. So it's just, uh, it's just a heartbreaker. Yeah, that that is a very very tough uh, situation, and you know, if anybody listening to this, let's say somebody in America or Canada, where our, our primary listener base is, if if they wanted to do a trip out to Lake Malawi, uh, let, let's say a first time traveler to to Africa to the Rift Lakes, you know, who would you recommend that they connect with, right? Because I mean, that's not just something that you can say, I'm gonna hop on a jet, take a connecting flight, right. and I'm gonna go to Lake Malawi. Right. Yeah, and Malawi is the best place to go to because it's closer. Um, Tanganyika is just a pain in the butt to get to. There's just no fast way. It's three days, no matter how, how fast you think you're going. It still takes three days to get there. Malawi, you can fly. You take a couple of days to fly in, and then you're just two hours to the lake. And um, the problem is, um, if you really want to go look at the fish, you've got to have a boat. And there's so few boats that are capable. And you've got to have somebody, if you're going to dive, you've got to have somebody that has the capability to fill the tanks. And they do send boats out of the Stuart Grant um, compound. Uh, but um, it's barely been one or two boats a year. So 16 people at the max going a year. 
Um, and the reason you would want to go on that particular trip is because somebody like Larry, who's been on the lake for 20 years, you know, he's going to, when you get to a site, he's going to be able to tell you, you know, what you're going to see at the site, you know, how deep it's going to be. Don't forget to look for this. And, you know, you, you have all that information and, you know, you could make it to the shore of Malawi and get in the water, but you're going to have no idea what you're, you know, what you're even looking at. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can imagine how just daunting that would be if somebody tried to do that on their own. So, if, yeah. if, so yeah. is there a website where somebody can go to to find out more information about that that we might be able to link in the notes if, if someone's interested? Well, um, if, yeah, if they're really, really interested right now for Malawi, Larry Johnson is the guy um, that does a trip every year. Oh, and so you have to direct, and, so directly reach out yeah. to him? You'd have to reach out to Larry. Yeah. Okay. Right. And... Um, and, you know, if someone is interested in that, they could email you, uh, email you. We could connect them with Larry. Gotcha. He's on Facebook, too. So um, if you're on Facebook, you could find him there. But uh, he's out of Canada, a real super nice guy, knows his fish, uh, been to the lake for the last 20 years. I've gone on a couple trips with him uh, in Malawi, and um, he's a fun guy to travel with. Excellent. And so what was your first trip to Africa like? If, if you can kind of walk me through, oh, like, apprehension, God. what were your feelings, your emotions? Well, I was so excited because I, you know, I never thought I would go to a foreign country and look at fish because I'm not really a camper, number one. I'm not really a glant, you know, I, I so uh, Caroline, my friend in Texas, talked me into going to Mexico and meeting up with Rusty Wessel and Juan Miguel and doing the um, Palenque um, area. And, oh, my God, I just had so much fun. And we wanted to go back again, and the guys were kind of saying, that, well, you know, there's no room on the next trip. And so we were kind of crying on Odd's shoulder, and Odd said, well, come to Africa with me. And I said, when? Let's go, you know. And Caroline was like, oh, I, uh, you know, she's a real Central American person, Central American cichlid person. And um, so we had, we planned to go, and it was like 14 months before we were going to actually go. So that drove me crazy for 14 months trying to figure out what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. I don't like water. I don't really, I mean, you've got to do some fast talking to get me into water. And um, so, had all this anticipation we actually landed in uh we went into zambia and we landed in lusaka and we rode on the back of a flatbed truck for 16 hours to get to the lake wow that... yeah that was for that was <laughs> that was a little bit Is... i mean we knew we were going to be in a truck okay but i had no idea so then we get to the lake it's dark okay it's like uh I mean, and it's so dark in Africa, so dark. And we are in Mpulungu, and we meet up with the guys, and then we have to go on about an hour-and-a-half boat ride to where we're going to actually be based out of. And uh, these guys just threw all the luggage in, in one boat, and it took off, and there's no lights. Nobody has any lights. And then they threw all, the, all of us. There was eight of us plus odd and in, in a boat, no life preservers, no lights, take off 100 miles an hour. And I just knew, I knew, I, I just thought, you know, okay, we're going to wreck. I'm going to crash. I'm so upset because I'm not even going to get to see this lake in the daytime. <laughs> oh, I couldn't believe it. Then I thought, well, for sure we're going to hit the boat with the luggage because I couldn't even see him, but I knew that he had to be in front of us somewhere. So that was, that was unbelievable trip. So 16 hours on the back of a uh, flatbed truck, and then an hour and a half on a in the middle of the blackest black water I've ever seen in my entire life. Next morning, wake up, look out, and see the view of that lake, and never thought about it again. <laughs> yeah, you forgot forgot all about that experience, and it was just it just <laughs> totally. amazing. Totally forgot about it. It was it was like when are we coming back? Uh, and so now, uh, did you actually get into the water and dive? Uh, I didn't dive. I had I had taken diving lessons before I was going to go, and I flunked. I aced the bookwork, but I could not I could not do the underwater. So I snorkel, mm. and um, I just snorkeled a little bit around there, maybe I don't know four or five six sites, and um, 
But I'm telling you, once I got my face in the water and I saw a fish that I had kept in an aquarium, it was just like, wow, this is so awesome. And uh, so once I had my face in the water and I got a fish in sight, then then I relax a little bit. It, it, but it was uh, it was quite the trip. It's kind of like the you know the the once in a lifetime pilgrimage that all aquarists kind of need to take, right? Yes. Is to go is to go to uh, where I, the fish were that I, you I, love go to that go to those endemic those home waters and swim with those fish. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was totally amazing. And so then uh, the next year, I just said, okay, let's where are we going this year? You know, and all of my friends, you know, they. You know, they have families and kids and children, and nobody's, everybody said they didn't have any money to do it again because it's very expensive. And um, uh, so I said that a couple of years. And then finally, I just said, I have to go to Lake Malawi now. I've been to Tanganyika. I have to go to Malawi. And I just on a whim, I was talking to Odd at the ACA, and I said, what if I meet you in Malawi? And he says, yeah, sure. I, we've got room if you want to come. And so... Then I had to, my husband said, I can't go unless somebody goes with me. And I didn't really want to fly by myself into, and, he, and Odd was going to Tanganyika and then traveling overland to Malawi. And so I, um, I just begged everybody. And then I finally realized that the only person I knew that had an, enough money to go and could take the time off work and da 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 da, because it was really short notice. I told Odd in July and, and we were leaving like in September. And so um, I coerced um, Steve Lundblad, Doogie, to go with me from Portland. You know him at the wet spot? Oh, yeah, I've heard the name. Yeah, I've never met him in person, mm -hmm. though. Very cool that you're able yeah. to get him to go. Yeah. So and he had gone to Tanganyika with me, and he had also gone on a trip to me with Mexico. And we had been friends forever. And so uh, I just begged him. I said, you got it. You know. And he had been to – that was one of the things that I loved about him, that he had been to Lake Malawi before. And so uh, I knew he wanted to go back really bad. And um, so anyway, thank goodness for Steve. He, so he and I took off and went to Malawi. We met up with Odd, and we just had the best time in the world. Oh, that is awesome. And um, then a couple other trips later, I, I went with Claudia, I don't know, three or four times. And um, I, just, I just can't seem to not go. It's just, uh, It's just so rewarding for me and so i just you know enjoy it so much that i i now right now i want to go every year so like so that's my so, plan yeah i i can imagine yeah so so lake tanganyika you've got a lake tang trip coming up right a long plane trip uh lake tanganyika you have a trip planned yeah. yes yes which will be a long plane uh, trip <laughs> It will be, yes. So what is, I guess, what's on the docket? What's on the agenda of, of things to do for this upcoming trip? What, what do you hope to see? What do you hope to do? Uh, kind of give us that breakdown. Okay. Well, I'm just, like, so excited because uh, we're going to fly. Uh, so I'll fly from Sacramento to Chicago, and I'll meet Odd in Chicago, and then we fly to Istanbul, his choice, not mine. <laughs> and then from Istanbul to Dar. And then Dar, we fly in as far as we can fly in is in Baya. And then they'll pick us up in um, like a land cruiser. And then it's about, I think, 10 hours to the lake from there. And um, I'm very excited because we're going to go south this year. We've gone north a few times, and we haven't gone south to Zambia. And I have not been to Zambia since the first time I went, which was uh, 2002. So that's, what, uh, 16 years. Mm-hmm. And Odd has not been back to Tanzania since, uh, I think, 2005. So he's excited. And um, we're going to uh, go into Tanzania, into Kapili, get on our, this boat at Lakeshore Lodge, which is the most fantastic boat in all of Africa um, for cichlid safaris. I mean, this boat is just absolutely amazing. And uh, we'll take the boat all the way down into Zambia. Go, uh, so we're going to go on the uh, east coast of uh, Tanzania, cross over to Zambia, go all the way to the Congo border. So the whole southern part of the lake we'll get to see. We'll go to the Sambu National Park and, um, um, you know, Kasanga, Kalambo, Impalungu, Kasakalawi, um, Chitika, 
all all the way around. Wow, that is super cool. And I'm actually looking at it right now on Google Maps, and I'm kind of you know envisioning mm-hmm. you kind of going around in, in a boat uh, along Lake yeah. Tanganyika. That is awesome. Are there any particular species that you're really hoping to, to run into, or is it just you know see it all? Well, I want to see everything I can, but of course I'm um, I'm on a trophyus binge, and so um, I'm very excited to go back and see all the Morii because uh, in that part of the lake, I mean every rock has a different colored Morii on it. Oh, and that. so that should be fantastic. And then, uh, oh, I like the feather fins, and, and uh, there should be some good, uh, some good ones down that way. Oh, that is fantastic, Pam. Well, I want to say thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your experiences in the hobby and talking about your, your uh, trips out into the, uh, to Lake Malawi, like the, your upcoming trip to Lake Tanganyika. Uh, I wish you, you know, a safe, safe travel on the, you know, two to three days of, of travel time. And then, you know, hopefully the, the truck is a little bit more comfortable this time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely looking forward to, you know, hopefully being able to connect with you in the future, hear more about your trips. And I would really encourage everybody. And I definitely know I will to, uh, look for your ask Pam articles and also check out the cichlid room companion for, you know, the works that you're putting up on that site. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and, uh, I'm on Facebook, I'm public, so anybody can follow me and, um, I will have, um, pictures of the trip. Once I get uh, back, I'll start posting those and I would love to come back and, and, uh, talk about the trip. So, Oh, awesome. For sure. I'll take you up on that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And so I'll make sure that I link your uh, Facebook profile. It's always hit or miss. I don't, I don't want to throw that out there on my guests that I'll, that I'll link their Facebook. But yeah, I mean, if, uh, if people can follow you and see those pictures, I mean, I'll, I, I'm already following you. So, um, what about a month away and I could start uh, a little over a month and start checking out some really cool pictures that you'll put up. Yeah, it should be really good. The weather's going to be great. And, uh, like I said, this boat we have right now is really wonderful. And um, we have eight divers, or eight people, I think five divers. So um, it, should be, uh, it should be really good. When you get that many people going, everybody sees something different. And it's so much fun when everybody gets up off the boat and everybody says what they saw and where they saw it. And, and uh, it's, just, it's just a lot of fun. Awesome, Pam. Well, that's definitely living the dream right there. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you very much for coming on tonight, Pam. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your evening. And again, safe travels, okay? All right. Thank you very much. All right, Pam. You have a good night now. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Thank you again for listening to the Aquarius Podcast. As always, get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.